Hello. Hello. Uh, How nice. are you? Good, thanks. Nice hey. to meet you. My name is Allison. Hi, Allison. Hi, Julian. I, I'm terrible at this because I, I'm sort of like twitchy and walky. So I've, you, I, I've wanna... got to pretend I'm on a late night show or something and sit, <laughs> sit down here. Well, we can stand up if you want. You Would that be more comfortable? Well, it, well, I just feel that maybe, yeah, then we're, we're, there's not a barrier between us. <laughs> let's, let's pull a chair out. Oh, yeah. The only thing is we're being filmed, so I don't ah. want to mess up the line of... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could kind of stand. Are you comfortable there? Yeah. Or yeah. here? Like if you want or here. Chair. Yeah. I like standing too. Great. So right. that's the fine. first ten minutes of the discussion. Just <laughs> but it's kind of like like uh, I don't know. It's like my business really. It's all about getting the camera ready. Yeah. yeah all right. It's, it's kind well, of your job. So. All right. Um, I, Hello, everybody. This is Julian. So well, I, of course, chaos. I don't, I don't know if we need an introduction, but I'll start with a quick introduction right. just to get us right. through the gate. So most of you are familiar with Julian, I think, <laughs> since you're yeah. here. But uh, you've seen him everywhere and in so many things. You've been in over 50 feature films, I believe. Yeah, that's old. Yeah, a lot. I do you, lots. A lot, yeah. yeah. Um, some of the highlights for me personally include Mimic, Cube, uh, hardcore logo, The Witch, uh, You Were in Naked Lunch, um, yeah. Urban Legend, he was in George Romero's last film, Survival of the Dead, and then of course his TV work, which I think a lot of folks here are very familiar with, uh, Supernatural, Never of course. Of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some show called Supernatural. Uh, you're in Kingdom Hospital, Hannibal, American Gods, the list goes on and on and on. So we'll uh, applaud again for Julie, <laughs> because it's so nice that you're here. Um, and I guess my, my first question for you um, is that I see from your CV that you came to, over on this side of the pond when you were an adult. So I'm wondering what yeah. brought you to this side of the pond so as an adult. So in 1980, I was in a show, um, a, a theater show. Uh, it was kind of weird and wonderful. It was an adaptation of James Joyce's Ulysses. So it was kind of very imagistic and crazy. And we were invited over. Um, oh, do you want me to speak in a mic? Oh, you could just. I'll it's, just turn oh, it in your direction. Project. Yeah, yeah, just project. Project. Just. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I came, and when when you come with a theatre company, you get put up on people's floors. There's no hotels and all that, right? You sleep on couches, and you, you, you take what you can get, kind of thing. And um, I was really lucky. I got put up on. Um, I, I was in a house in, uh, I guess now it would be Little Italy, at Lippincott, at College in Bathurst in Toronto. And these great people just said, yeah, sure, you know, make yourself at home. And I really got on with these people. And then we carried on our tour to Chicago and New York. Oh, thank you. Um, and then uh, I just really got on with the folks that I met in this. There was about four or five different apartments in this house, and I, I liked everybody. And then I came back again, and then sort of came back about three times and then I met my wife <laughs> who's from Toronto and uh, so she was sort of a friend of one of the people in this house and so we were married in 84 which made me legal like like a landed immigrant and I started to do specific work in Toronto in 84 and I've stayed ever since I had a had kids and I've got some friends here who live just up the road from me <laughs> yeah yeah. So, um, so, and I've been Toronto based, but the, so, the, the, you know, I go, I always, I always make a point of going. I was in uh, New York, Chicago, and Toronto. And which one did I choose? Toronto. And I say that with affection because, really, in 1980, I was so excited by Toronto. I, I mean, I met some great people, which was obviously a big part of it. But for me, it was really exciting to be in a city that was kind of formulating its own identity and really growing and that like music theater film was all kind of shifting and changing and I felt very much a part of a new energy and I met some great people in the theater and I started to do mainly theater in the 80s um, but you know and then as a, as a dad you got to earn more money than just doing theater so I started to do commercials 
and I would do like weird commercials for the game Balderdash. Anybody oh, name, I remember that Balderdash. game? Balderdash. <laughs> remember that game? It's like I, so I did yeah. that. Like, and they were never like regular. Look at this sexy man. <laughs> <laughs> they were all like, they, he's weird. Like, <laughs> like we'll get him to sell something strange, you know. So I did those, but it was great because I would do those, and then I'd do theater, and I just, I just keep going, and then. I drifted more and more and more into film, and a friend of mine, Bruce McDonald, who is a filmmaker, an independent filmmaker, who is Toronto-based, I sort of started to do more stuff with him, and I started to do, and I sort of, as you, as you can tell by me, I'm kind of theatrical, and I, I kind of, like I, I've had to learn how to tone down my performance and my energy to film and television. And uh, it's been fun. I've, I've really enjoyed it. But the kind of roles that I've done, you know, you say I've been in a lot of films. It's because I guess I'm a character actor. And um, as a character actor, you tend to be in a lot of different things, but not necessarily for a long time. So I'll be the guy that, oh, he's interesting. Oh, he's dead now. <laughs> uh, you know, or, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So I do tend to do a lot of work. Um, and you'll often see me, and people often say, you're that guy in, um, uh, and they can't name it because they recognize my face because they've seen it about three times, being shot or killing somebody. Or so. So it, but it's fun, I, and uh, I, I have no regrets. Um, along those lines, because you said you're a theatrical person, but you're a character actor, how yeah. do you perform character actor roles without overtaking that's everything that's happening like you yeah. know what I mean like yeah, do, I do. do you have to be like huh okay yeah I it's a really good space. point because yeah. in in a way when you do so let's say supernatural say it's it's um it's a show and it's got a brand right it, you know and it's the two boys and Castiel and like it, it's very specific and it appeals to a very particular audience so if I come in as a character actor you're right you know I can't be like the big guy, look at me, everybody. I, I'm the flavor of the week. So you got to bring something that is a good color, like a primary color um, that works, but it doesn't overtake everything else. You know, so you sort of, you learn to do it. That's, that's kind of how I figured it out. And sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. Like, And I can honestly say with Supernatural, it was easy because Jared and Jensen were so cool and relaxed in who they are. They don't feel threatened by a character actor coming and stealing the show. Like they play it for real. And they, they know that in the end it benefits them if it's somebody that's strong and has a strong scene with them. So a lot of my success as the character of death has to do with the fact that Jared, sorry, Jensen, um, played it so well with me like he played it as an equal he didn't play it like well I'm the star of the show so this is my scene he really played the whole idea in the pizza parlor of being terrified of me and he really made me look good but then I made him look good you know what I mean and he was very generous and it, it sort of works but I'm sure all of you know in different work situations that like with egos and stuff it doesn't always work that way and you, you you're struggling a little bit to try and either establish yourself or to, to figure it the, the dynamic out. But Supernatural is an example where it's really easy. There's been other shows that you, you go in and you go, oh, okay, I'll just, I'll keep quiet. <laughs> and, and, and then there's other ones where you, it just doesn't feel right that you, you know, you just tone it down a little bit. But it's always an adjustment. It's not like I have a secret formula. I, everything's different. Everything, um, you okay there? Yeah. I'm being spontaneous. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, so here's an example, you know, where I, I sort of, I like to, like, for me, you guys are the most important in the room because you're here. You're right here, and I'm a theater actor, and you're my audience, and we're in the room together with the same energy. And I, I actually find it very difficult when there's two things. Um, because you sort of you, you're having to oh like two audi like the audience yeah because like I'm, like I'm having to respect the camera and you're having yeah. to respect the camera yeah. and playing it there and there's I mean, me I'm not, I'm not, doing all this I'm, stuff I, <laughs> so it's very interesting but I, I'm always aware of the dynamic in a room hmm. you know um, what yeah. that must make dinner parties very interesting for you <laughs> <laughs> although you know so here's an interesting I. I my, my friends here, you know, young actors, and they, they, they go to a youth club and they, they youth theater and they, they do work. 
and I would say that as an actor, you don't always have to be the, the biggest thing in the room. I'm here and I'm being given permission by you to be who I am. So it's kind of up to me to come in and do this and be the guy that's interesting and got a big personality. But that's why I like acting, is that I'm not like that, really. I'm, I'm, not, I'm shy, and I actually have always found it hard to... Like, if I was in a bar and there was, like, ten people, I, I would be more interested in listening to the other nine people than I would be going, hey, I've got this great story about this and that and the other. So, so I don't think to be an actor you have to kind of dominate and, and be the, the most interesting person in the dinner party. Actually, often actors listen and, and there mm. uh, and I, I'm a middle child I have a, an older brother and a younger brother and I'm very aware how different I am with like an older brother and a younger brother and how like I'm sometimes I suffer from not really even knowing who I am because I'm an actor and I sort of put on a costume and then I go somewhere else so. wow this is getting very deep <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Any other penetrating questions? Oh, <laughs> lots of deep, lots of deep dives coming. Um, I want, I want to like put a pin in Supernatural because I know a lot of folks here will have questions yeah. specifically about that show yeah. for you, um, and I think we'll cycle back to that in a little bit. But I wanted to just ask. Mo, honestly, this is a selfish question. Um, Hardcore Logo is one of my favorite movies. Great. Um, yeah, it was the first time I saw you in anything. Like that's my primary association with you is, right. as, as Bucky Hate. Yeah. Um, have people seen hard, Hardcore Logo here or familiar with the concept? Yeah. So right. Julian basically plays this uh, reclusive rock star who yeah. and has a big mythology about him. And then um, it's the movie is a, mock, a mockumentary about a fictional band kind of touring Canada. And they are making this pilgrimage to Bucky Hate. They like worship Bucky Hate. And he's this very shadowy figure the movie's whole narrative like they do a benefit concert for him he may have cancer no one knows what's going on and yeah. so they go to Bucky Hate's estate and like find out what is actually going on with, with Bucky and you do such a good job of like playing that character which is who's enigmatic but yet not ultimately right. at the end and I, I guess I wondered how did you and Bruce Bruce McDonald was the director yeah um, and I'm wondering how did you two develop that character like how did you know what type of I guess rock star he was going to be well I just for that one so Bruce and I met basically on the streetcar in Toronto I, I he recognized me and I sort of went oh hi and then we did a film called the top of his head which was a Peter Mettler film and Bruce was an editor that's how he started off his career and he edited that film and then I started to you know we started to see each other regularly and he said about Hardcore Logo, but he didn't quite know what the balance was going to be. He didn't quite know who was going to play the lead uh, singer, which was played by Hugh Dillon originally, uh, eventually. But I guess what I would say is that I... So coming from England, the, um, my influences in the 70s were not necessarily theatre and film. They were rock and roll, right? So the big thing for me was punk. In, in the mid 70s. So um, at the time, I mean, it was Joe Strummer, The Clash, the, like, the Sex Pistols, that all the bands that were changing society, that was where the energy was. And I really was fascinated by and, and into that music, The Stranglers. There were, there were just so many of them. And um, I kind of pitched him, uh, like if I was Joe Strummer meets um, Iggy Pop meets uh, I don't know, all my heroes, really. And Shane McGowan from the Pogues. It was, there, there was, like, some... I don't know, it was... And then it was me and my background. And so I... Yeah, I just kind of went for my influences and, and played that. And it's one of the few films that I've actually done that. Most films, you have to sort of construct the mythology of the writing. But because of the way Bruce works, he allowed me to be this hybrid of all the people that... I fan like wanted to be and fantasized about, right? A fan boy, like I guess as a fan, you know, yeah. a fan of those bands. Uh, when you were in Toronto, this is a total sidebar, but when you came to Toronto in the 80s, did you get involved in Toronto's punk scene that was burgeoning at that time? Uh, uh, not much, because it had kind of come and gone by right. the 80, like it, the really hot scene was like 76, 77, 78. 
but I, I do have a funny story about it, and, and that was, um, I, I do a lot of films with um, first-time directors. I, I'll make a point of working at the Canadian Film Centre or at Ryerson, especially with young emerging voices. I think it's really important to Canadian culture. Like It's so important that we develop our own sensibility and our own stories. Um, I did Cube with Vincenzo from the Film Centre, and, and there's been a few other shows that I've done. So one, one guy came up to me and he said, would you be in my film? I'm doing a short and uh, I'd love you to be in it. It's perfect for you. I love Hardcore Logo. And I think you played my dad in that film. And I went, really? And he said, yeah, my dad's Chris Haight. And Chris Haight was the guitarist for the Viotones, right. which was, uh, yeah. uh, and so his, uh, his real name is Chris Paputz. And uh, his son, Key Ray, um, is an emerging... Yeah, I know uh, his movies, yeah. And so oh, he directed... Uh, so I said, wow, sure. So there was a kind of confluence of... Hmm. Um, Key Ray was into the scene, and I learned about the Toronto punk scene retroactively, like through Key Ray and through his dad and through... But I wasn't really a part of it. Hmm, okay. And I think that's kind of the lot of the actor, to be honest with you. I'd, like... I think actors are more sort of like flies on the wall and then if they're lucky they get to portray some of those people that they watch. They're not necessarily the really amazing, fantastic people in the middle of a of an event or, or a movement. Yeah. yeah. Um, I read in the past, uh, in other interviews, probably something about Supernatural, where you've talked about uh, being a British person, person in North America and doing, you know, North American productions a lot in Toronto, that you sometimes had to modulate your Britishness or oh, me yeah. mediate it. Yeah. Um, can you explain to me sort of how that... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, well, I, you can see, I, you know, I have an accent. It's, uh, I, I've got grown-up Toronto kids, so, and, you know, they'll often go, Dad, you have to talk like that, you know, like <laughs> tone it down, Dad. So I've, I've learned to modulate my Britishness, I guess, over the years. And also because it wasn't cool to be British in the 80s and 90s in uh, the Toronto art scene. Quite rightly, because... Hello. That's my agent. <laughs> <laughs> Scotiabank. Oh. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'd better answer it and say hello. Uh, it's, it's one of those robocalls or something that goes, um, we've, we've got your PIN number or something. Anyway, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so in the 80s, it, so and I was mainly involved in theatre in the 80s, and it was about developing a Canadian voice. And even places like Stratford, uh, the Stratford Festival, they didn't want British accents in there. They wanted Canadian accents. They wanted people to identify with it, which is really healthy. Like, I'm very happy with that. Um, but at the same time, I can't deny who I am. I'm not going to sort of, like, put on a fake Canadian accent because it would sound terrible and it, it wouldn't look authentic. So I was kind of caught a little bit. But the way I look at it is that often I'll play a British guy within a Canadian context. Like, we'll do it if there's a historical show often there are British figures in Canadian history, obviously. Um, in more contemporary shows like um, Orphan Black, it, Toronto is shot as Toronto as it is now, which is as an international city. You don't kind of go, well, they don't sound very Canadian. It doesn't matter, like you're from all over the place, which is, again, really good. Um, but I've also learned that, you know, there are certain things that, in my accent that if, as long as I put a lens on it, I don't, like, nothing screams me, you know, it, it's sort of like I, I've, I've learned to put a filter on, on my accent. So I did a, a show in Chicago uh, about three years ago called Patriot for uh, Amazon. And I had to play a guy from Chicago, which was a challenge for me. And so I kind of like walked around speaking out the back of my throat and kind of trying it, you know, and looking in the mirror and talk, talk, talking and trying to be like stop doing this you know like british people speak like this and american people can't speak like this. Anyway, that's, that's kind of like a really bad shorthand of, of an approach so anyway i i, I try to find a different way of speaking and 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 not go you know call blimey and, and not doing sort of british things but i've i've i figured it out and 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 it was interesting that the showrunner of that show 
I didn't dare talk about my accent because I thought, what if he finds out that I'm British and he'll fire me or, he, you know, I thought, I'll just keep it quiet and I'll speak like this. Oh, so and you kept the Chicago accent the whole time? I kept, I, well, I, like, when I was talking to him um, in person, I would sort of use this mid-Atlantic kind of voice that I, ha I can do a little bit. Yeah. A little bit, you know, not little bit. Like, I can drop things. Yeah. So I would do that. And then I said to him, once I, I built up the courage to say, nothing wrong with the accent, it's fine. He went, oh, no, no. Your accent's a part of who you are. And it's like, he's a quirky character. And, and he said, what is an American accent? And I, it was music to my ears because yeah. often you hear this thing of like, well, you're supposed to talk like this. You're supposed to say your vows like that. So that was really a, a pleasant surprise. And that I could survive in that environment with, as I am. But I can't complain. I mean, I, I've, I'm, I'm a character, like I'm, I'm very, very specific. So I don't fit into a, a, a mainstream sort of hybrid, really. Um, here you sort of talk about that. I can see why you would have been cast in a movie like The Witch, because there's like, I feel like there's a seamless fit in your role at the beginning of the film where you're sort of this, and it's Puritan, yeah. so you can't understand what anyone's saying in that really? movie anyway. <laughs> uh, So it like worked through that. And I wanted to ask you about that specifically um, did you have a sense when you were doing it that you that it would be a big deal? I know people ask this question a lot about movies no, like that. No, not but. really. I, I knew it was incredibly, like the meticulous attention paid to detail, mm -hmm. which was really unusual. For Like I do a lot of independent films and in independent films, you'll notice that the wardrobe for my characters is pretty similar because it's mine. <laughs> like, like, there's no money for wardrobe, so it's like, what can you wear that looks like the character? Well, I got, you know, I got a jacket at home. I can wear that. And honestly, that's often the thing. So it, it, as a result, it doesn't really look like it's a world of its own. It does look a bit secondhand and borrowed sometimes. This movie, The Witch, I was amazed. Like he, he was an absolute fanatic for detail, and um, right down to the wardrobe. I, I ended up. We did. A, we shot a bunch of scenes that weren't used in the movie because they wanted to get out of the village and into the wild, which was really what the, the whole movie was about. But um, in order to do the other scenes in the village, I think all of them, I was kind of sitting in a position of power, and I don't think you ever saw my feet but they ordered my shoes to come from Italy. They were ha ha homemade or handmade oh, in wow. Italy in the authentic way that they would have been done back in that the year. Now, how he got the money to do that, I don't know. Whether he was pulling favors, whether he, or what, but he had that meticulous attention to detail. And mm. that shows in, in the film. And we shot it in Madawa, Ontario, um, which he researched had um, an infrastructure of forestry that was very similar to the way that the Puritans originally came. So even the trees were important to him. You know, I look at a tree, a tree is a tree to me, but not to him. He was very, very particular about everything. Hmm. So um, so I was a very particular element, and he wanted authentic British too. Like there was no way that you could have been uh, a Canadian putting on a, like a good British accent, which most Canadians can do, but yeah. he was really a stickler. So he, yeah, he really wanted your British accent. He, wa he really yeah. wanted it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it was an interesting thing recently. Oh, I, I can tell you about this. I, I've, um, I've done a film about David Bowie, which is, I'm very excited about. And it's not a jukebox musical. It's not like, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody or like, here's his greatest hits redone. <laughs> it's actually about the, uh, the um, years before David Bowie became Ziggy Stardust. So it's his struggling years. And his brother is struggling with mental illness and he doesn't know how he's going to make it, and who he is, whether he's doing pop songs or kids songs or what. So it's it's really good. Um, I think it's a really good premise. Anyway, um, it was interesting that um, the casting director, no, no, the director of the film cast particular people because, and he came up with the idea that there are faces that are British never thought about it like that and I never think of, I don't look at a face and go oh that's a Ukrainian face or and because it's a bit of a weird thing to say but the, so uh, anyway he to me or to him I had a Britishness about whatever that was so, there you go 
That movie sounds great. Yeah, I, th I think I it would be fun. It yeah. would be fun. And there's a, a musician called Johnny Flynn who plays Bowie. And Johnny, Johnny Flynn is actually a really good musician in his own right. He has his own band in the UK. And I think he does a really good job. So it should be fun. And do you play, are you allowed to say what you, yeah, what you play? Yeah, I, I, I play his manager, Tony DeFries. Holy crap, that's uh, amazing. Who, who is, uh, that's and awesome. Tony DeFries was one of those, uh, they called him Deep Freeze. He was like one of those managers that was pr pretty significant in, yeah. uh, in the time. Although in, in this story, this is not the, the manager's story. You know, I'm, I'm a color yes. within the story, but um, it's more about him, com Bowie coming to America and trying to, understand what America was all about mm. and then going back and then coming up with the idea of Ziggy. So, that sounds yeah. great. Um, just taking a look here. Um, sort of going back to, um, you know, you were saying you, you work with indie directors as much as you work on bigger productions. Um, yeah. And I know you've worked with a lot of indie horror folks, like the people from Black Fawn yep. with Ejecta and Septic Man, which I loved but also hated watching. It was such it was like gross. physically so gross. gross. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they really went for it. Have you yeah. guys seen that movie? It's just so, disgust. It's like toilets and oh, and living in a sewer and like just a total body horror nightmare. Yeah. I'm very proud it's Canadian to do that. <laughs> the fine tradition of body horror in Canada. I think when, well, on the title and and uh, like the subtitle, shit happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never get enough. Um, yeah. uh, and I wanted to ask, um, you have such a unique vantage point because of your your flexibility and your willingness to do, you know, different types of genre ro roles yeah. with different budgets and, as you said, different levels of attention to detail. Um, and I wonder from your vantage point, um, you know, it's the horror genre has changed quite a bit and, you know, there's more movies, I think, looking to movies like The Witch you know being sort of i hate using this term and i will probably use it again today but elevated horror like sort of uh, a horror art film type of thing okay um, yeah. and i wonder sort of from your vantage point not not asking you to make a grand sweeping statement but right. the state of the genre as you're seeing it from the projects you're working on do you see it changing from what it was before, like in the 80s or the 90s, or do you feel like there's a turn happening at all? I think the spirit is the same, yeah. right? Like the spirit of horror is fantastic because it's like, I, I don't know, there's an, uh, there's an honesty about horror. It's more about our fears and, and the flip side of those perfect stories that we see presented to us all the time. It's what happens if something went wrong or those characters messed up, or somebody got in a terrible position. It's our fears, and I think that's something we all identify with, and we all identify with being vulnerable. Uh, and uh, so there's a kind of a weird democracy about horror films. It's kind of, turn, it, it, people aren't pretty, or if there are pretty people, they're threatened by the, the sociopaths, and the ugly people, and the strange people, and the, the you know, whatever. It, it's so. I love that. I, I, I think that's very important. Um, so the spirit is still there. It's taken a bunch of different turns. It's gone into all kinds of stuff. And it, like at one point it was torture porn. And like, you know, there, there was some stuff where I go, oh, I, I just, I can't watch that. I don't know why people are doing that. And you were in a Saw movie, right? Yeah, it was, I, my death was considered to be too gruesome for the franchise at one point. Was, they did they did yeah. a death for me in a glass cabinet or something it was pretty awful but it didn't seem particularly odd i mean i've done a few strange things and i work with uh, special effects and makeup a lot and it uh, my character was one of those where i think they basically i think mine was saw three and they had like a storyboard and they'd have like this character is going to go here and that, like it wasn't it, it was flexible as to how it was going to go and then they decided that mine would meet a grisly end quickly as opposed to what they were setting me up for they needed to go in some other direction and then they gave me this really grisly death but my grisly death was never seen what was the death well it was i got cut to pieces i think oh my god i think I, can't, it's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it Did sounds I die bad. In that one? How was, yeah, no, I, I, and they didn't use it. 
they didn't yeah. yeah yeah i and there was you know there's always different reasons for somebody doesn't like that or we've already got one impact point in the movie we don't need that one and that right. guy's not any longer important enough to merit a sticky end you know what i mean like there's all these decisions going on but i like that i, I gotta say i like that about uh horror films and there's a sort like i said there's a kind of a democracy about it in that you go on set you leave your ego behind it's not about you know what a great actor you are it's about making a gag work it's about rhythm it's like okay so we at the end of this scene we, we're suddenly going to get a big jump or a big scare you can't be chewing the scenery for the first half of that scene because it detracts from really where the scene is going to so you're in um, collaboration with all the technical artists in the film all special effects sound makeup and you have to make this thing work and I, I really enjoy it. I have two brothers that are designers so I I understand the technical side of things and I like the idea that if you move to that the light there it's going to be much more frightening than if you act your heart out and you but you act it over here but if it's there it's like that's kind of fun mm -hmm. it's the opposite of theater but I like uh, film as a technical medium too so so it doesn't bother me it doesn't bother me being under prosthetics for four hours listening to a special effects team talking for you know two hours about the uh, guy getting his finger shot off in taxi driver like you know they'll go on at length about stuff that actors never do it's a like real technical jargon and it's fascinating for me so I like that I, I like that part of it so anyway long-winded answer but but so the spirit is is the same yeah. but I think technology has changed to the point where it's easier to make there, horror films there's more out there so it's not surprising to me that there are some horror films that, that are uh, distinguishing themselves by saying we're more serious we're more artistic we're more what was the word you term you used the something horror oh elevated elevated oh. High, you know <laughs> elevate like in terms of like we're taking ourselves very seriously and we have more money yes and we, we're going to make it more operatic yes you know? um but i like the diy stuff the you know mm -hmm. the george romero and the, you know like there are so many examples uh what was it like working with george romero on his last uh like dead film a lot of fun i mean he's so relaxed yeah so enjoyable to work with and uh, you know obviously you're working with a legend so yeah. everybody's very re referential to him but he was just really a lovely man mm. Lo and loved what he was doing and uh s simple thing like so there was one scene and it was a, a very low budget film there, there was one scene where um i was part of a gang of of people that were breaking into a house because we thought that there might be zombie children on the second floor and we were going in there as a sort of a vigilante group so the scene starts with a, the, a picture of a boot kicking the door in and it's all going into the house and they're running up the stairs and finding zombie children upstairs and uh, you know we were already behind schedule and it's the afternoon and the producers saying we've got like five scenes to shoot yet and time's getting on and somehow the door that we were supposed to kick in it, it wasn't finished it didn't look right we tried it one time and the door fell down in the wrong way and people were getting upset and mad and and there were people like yelling carpenters were yelling and the producers were yelling and George is just sitting there he goes um okay guys um I've got an idea forget the door let's start the scene inside and we'll hear the door be smashed in off camera and he said, because what's the scene about? It's not about the door being kicked in. It's about the time that you go up the stairs and you see the zombie children. That's the shock. So he was able to detach his ego. And he wasn't like he was not saying, but I need this door. It's going to make my scene. He was able to say, scheme of things, what can we do? Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I love that about him. And he was never sort of standing on his reputation. It's not one of his greatest films. I think he, you know, many people would be uh, the first to say that, but, or not the first to say that, I mean, but, you know, it was, it was just a pleasure to be involved with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think this will be my last question and then we'll turn it over to the folks that are here to see if they've got any questions for you. Um, but you sort of alluded before that you've done a lot of strange things and I have no doubt that you have and I think 
we've seen some of them. Um, is there any recent strange things you've had to do that stick out in your mind where you're just sort of in the middle of it and you're like, what, what job is this? What am I doing? It happens a lot, really. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think the funniest thing, well, the funniest, strangest one was I was in a, uh, a it, back in the day when it used to be MOWs, Movers of the Week, before we used to get like um, mini series and stuff. Well, Toronto was a big center for Movers of the Week, kind of low budget features, right, that were shown on TV. And um, uh, what, uh, I can't remember what the name of the, the outfit is. They're from Atlanta and they did a bunch of movies. Two American names and then a bunch of Canadian actors. And I did, so I did one called The Time Shifters. And it was actually a really cool concept where this guy was seen at a series of disasters, like the Hindenburg disaster, um, and way back, like uh, as long as there's recorded footage, there's always this guy with a bowler hat at the disaster. And then our heroes begin to realize that who is this guy? Is he an architect of disasters? Where does he come from? Does he come from outer space? What's going on? So it, it eventually turns out that this guy is a tourist from the future and he's a disaster tourist. He's paying money to come to any disasters that happen on Earth. And then he goes back to the future. That's me. I play that guy. And so there's a great scene in the movie where our hero is on a plane. And then he looks across and there's me sitting there with the bowler hat. And then he looks and he goes, there's going to be a, the plane's going to go down. The plane, like, what's going to happen? And then he alerts it. He tries to tell everybody and everybody thinks he's mad. And then they, they try and... Uh, sort of capture him and t tie him down. But indeed, the, tr the plane starts to go down. So it's pretty terrifying, pretty great idea. Anyway, you can imagine that after that, there were a few incidents when I would be on a plane. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, it's him, it's that guy. And I, and I would actually then immediately go, the plane's not going down, it's okay. It's okay, you know, because it, it's sensitive, right? It's yeah. like it's a sensitive subject. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, so that was one of the ones where I, I thought, wow, this is strange. And it's kind of, it's, it's creepy. It's, mm. there, there is something very creepy about that. <laughs> Um, and and there there are funny ones too. I, I it's fun being in a show like Supernatural that has such a wide fan base, and people would just you know like in Toronto, but a lot of people go, "Hey, Death, how you doing?" <laughs> like you know, like it, it's very funny. So, but but I gotta say, you know, I, I said about horror, the the, um, the 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 technology has changed, so has fandom, and so so has events like this where. Fans really are a part of horror culture now, mm -hmm. and that's a that's a fun thing for me. It's a fun thing that people will engage in a conversation, and and people are very respectful, and sometimes people are shy. But I, I feel people are um, are enabled access to people that they see on the screen because of social media, because of fan conventions. We're on the same level. We're in the same room. We're talking. It's not like you know, Sir Julian Richings will appear at a certain time. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. I, yeah. I think that. Which, you know, again, comes to, like, it's fun being in a room with you guys. Not in, not on camera. <laughs> <laughs> no. So it's, it's, but it's real. It's a, you know, it's a real thing. It's fun. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Julian? Don't be shy. Any, su any supernatural questions? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. Play in how it was created because I've noticed that they really do their research. What well, they do, they, I, they, I can't they, find anything leading up to your scene. The only thing I can grasp is death from a crew. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I do, do you guys know what we're talking about here? It's um yeah. supernatural parody. It's a, it's a phenomenon. Again, this is part of technology and something that's completely new to me. But. So there, there are these two sisters that do these parodies of very well-known shows, meticulously researched and generally put to music, right? Um, they asked me to be on it, and they said, would you come and make an appearance? Sure! You know, fly me down to Vegas, and, uh, which is what, because they, they're Las Vegas-based, and, and they said, well, we're going to do this, this, and this. Would you make an appearance? Sure. Um, I, I didn't know what I was going to be doing, um, but they... 
they, I was just literally a little a, a snapshot within the, the song. But for me, that's, that's fun. I, I'm, I'm happy to do that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So. You know, every little bit, like even when you watch the bloopers, it's like they went back that far. Yeah, I know. It's they, incredible. Yeah. Really yeah. And, it, and it's incredible the knowledge base that um, fan culture has mm -hmm. about actors. Uh, you know, I can't believe people will come up to me. And I'm really proud that they do. You know, I'm, I'm in a lot of supernatural, a lot of American money in there. But people will also come up to me and, and do stuff like, uh, and say, um, oh, um, oh, I the, the name has escaped me now. Uh, uh, what's the, uh, Amber Marshall in uh, uh, the horse show that shot in Calgary, prime time. Julian, Homeland. Homeland, thank you. Uh, home, Heartland. Oh, Heartland. Heartland. Yeah, Heartland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, Good. Homeland, I think. Is Heartland. Different. So somebody will come out and go, Heartland, you were in, you, I loved you in Heartland. I go, really? That's fantastic. I was in two episodes as a guest because it's a Canadian show and. They want Canadian actors in it. And I think, wow, that's that's great that that there is that knowledge and that fan base out there. And I'm kind of proud to be a Canadian actor in that, you know. Sometimes I'm Canadian content where they've got we've got to find an, a Canadian actor to put in here somewhere. And I know that I am, but you know, hey, I'll I'll do that. But there are other times when I go, Wow, this is great. I'm part of something. Any other questions? Two questions. Um, so the David Bowie movie, do you, can you say the name of the movie? That I, I can't say too much about okay. it, but I can I, it's Stardust, as far as I know. Okay, because as my brother's Ziggy, a huge right? fan of David Bowie, so if I can let him yeah, know. Yeah, um, and I don't know where it is in production okay. or what the right, but it's, it's okay to say that yeah. I'm in it. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll keep it and, okay. and if you look it up, I think you'll probably find information about it. Okay. Um, that. There's been some contention about uh, rights mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the David Bowie estate is very difficult to get uh, music rights mm -hmm. for, uh, and so uh, you might find stuff about it sort of obliquely through that. Okay. Yeah. And my second question: So you played death like so well. Like, what was <laughs> your like? Did you have any reference that you went for that role? Because just I know like Jensen uh, like you said you acted well together but yeah just the first scene that you see you you're like oh god <laughs> this yeah. guy is something well it was so, a great montage right yeah, exactly. that, that's an amazing montage so it's like a rock video I mean that that soundtrack and, and and the guy falling over when I did it I had no idea it would end up looking like that it was, I thought oh this could be good but I had no idea it would be that effective so right away it's great because I'm given this massive intro. Yeah, exactly. So I'm given significance like that. Um, but, you know, in terms of my choices, I'm a good actor in that I'm aware of a script and the demands of a script, right? Uh, and that I can kind of figure things out and I can do my own homework. Yeah. And the clues that they gave me in the script were really good and they were that this guy eats pizza and likes pizza, but he's like the most powerful person in the world, which is a lovely contradiction for an actor to play, right? Rather than just, come, I'm the most powerful man yeah, exactly. in the world. Like, so I, right away I was given permission not to play it on one note, but to play counterpoint. So to be very relaxed and to go, would you like some more? You know, it's much more intimidating exactly. than if you go, have some more because I'm strong and powerful. Yeah. So it gave me permission to do that. And then I realized when I look back on it, um, I grew up in, well, when I was a kid in the 60s, I watched Hammer Horror a lot, right? How, um, and I, d I didn't ever do it consciously, but who was in Hammer Horror? Like Peter Cushing. Mm -hmm. um, and then Peter Lorre, uh, Christopher Lee, and so many of those guys, they're my influences. And I realized that, you know, there's, a, there's an aristocratic British elegance about it that I'm clearly channeling. Yeah. I, I did, didn't ever consciously do it, yeah, but it's, so it's coming from that, that kind of era, right? And, and again, I was given permission to be different. Like, I have to look like I don't belong in the world of Chicago and the boys, that it's okay to look like you're from outside and from a different class. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Who would you say is your favorite character in Supernatural? Well, they're, 
So I, li- I like some of the, the sort of character actors because I identify with that, right? Um, so I like people like um, Kevin, Kevin Tran. <laughs> you like, yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's great. And, and um, Osric is a lovely guy. So I, I almost find it hard to distinguish between the two. Like I, so they're, they're, he's a lot of fun. But the two boys are great. I, I really, I mean, it's very unusual that you can watch a show for 15 seasons and still be interested in them and them not just become a caricature of themselves. You know what I mean by a caricature, right? Like where you can predict everything that they're going to do every time that they... Like you, you've got certain expectations and, and you think, that's great, that's the way that he did that. I knew that he would do that. But they will also surprise you. And they'll also... and their character arcs, you know, what we sort of say is an arc where if you start in one place and you get to the, another place by the end of the, this, the episode, their arcs are sometimes surprising and they betray each other. And what I like about both of those characters is that they fail. And that to me is like a human quality that, that we all have. And that's, again, what I like about horror is that it's about failures and fears. It's not just about being perfect. Right, so I, I like the two brothers for that in that they, they're messing up, they're always messing up, and particularly in relation with like my character, they're messing up all the time, right to the point where they kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was the attire for, for the headstones. How was it like working with you? The, the, with you, the what with the headstones? I, I was the uh, photographer, yeah, yeah, my dad took me. Oh wow! He's also a photographer too. Cool. All right. And what was it like for me working with them? Yeah. With the with the the band. Hugh Dillon. With Hugh. Yeah. So Hugh Dillon, um, who is the lead in Harco Logo, um, g- gives the movie an awful lot of authenticity because he really was for many years the lead in, in a band called The Headstones which was kind of like the, the hip in a way in that they were truly Canadian band that would tour and tour and tour um, I don't, so I never worked with the band I just worked with Hugh and he was fantastic and very respectful also very um, very humble in that he knew that he was a rock and roller and not an actor and he knew that I was an actor and would sort of ask me questions, and I would go, oh, you don't need to ask me questions, but he, was, he wanted to get stuff right, right? Um, I, I thought he was brilliant, and Hugh Dillon is responsible for the ending of Harco Logo. He that came was, up with that. He came up with that, that yeah. was not scripted. He said, this is the only way it can end, and, and Harco Logo does have a remarkable ending, yeah. and that's Hugh, because Hugh was a rock and roll guy, and he said, if this guy's gonna go on this journey, and he's going to go through all these different things. There's only one way that this story can end. And uh, he convinced Bruce, the, the director, that, that to change it and to just shoot it. And he didn't tell anybody before he, um, he did what he did right at the end. So it was like everybody was completely shocked. Oh, my gosh. So it was a real, it, it was one of those moments. So, so uh, I mean, I guess the short answer to that is that they were great. They were <laughs> really good. Um, and... It's fun for me as an actor when I work with people from different disciplines, like from music, dancers, art, visual artists. I really like that um, when, when I work. So that they're trying to do the same thing, but with a slightly different language. It's a lot of fun. Um, one more, and then I think we'll be wrapping it up. Yeah. So I know that uh, Jensen and Jared tend to play pranks on a lot of uh, cast members entering into yeah. Supernatural. Did they ever play any pranks on you? They didn't dare. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I I tell to people. Lots of people ask me that, you know. And and I go, oh, really? And then I've looked up and, yeah, sure enough, there are pranks. (laughs) But the thing that I say about those guys is that um, they're they're relaxed. They're in control. They're the one and two in the show, right? Mm -hmm. So they affect the way the show runs. And they're very easy and relaxed but they keep it that way like that's deliberate to so not get things too intense so I can understand they've got, they, you know they bring a mischief to work which is really good keeps people on their toes but they're professional 
And if there's a scene that's very complicated, they wouldn't just goof around, right? So there's a time and a place for that. And it's weird that the scenes that I always did with them were always quite complicated. Like there'd be like some big special effect or the, you know, the building shaking or me getting hit with the scythe or some of the food, food scenes are always very difficult because you have to figure out what you're eating, how much you're eating and all that. So there was no real room for it with me. So that's the serious answer oh, yeah. is that, that in my situation, no. But I understand why they kept things relaxed and they kept stuff like people having fun, you know. Yeah. Okay, folks, that's, I think Just that's it for our chat. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you to Julian for thank being the most wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great. And Julian will be back downstairs.